Hello, welcome to the January 2018 edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. I'm Portia Young. In this episode, two young dreamer immigrants talk about their accomplishments here, their fears, and their courage to take leaps of faith. Plus, meet the man who handles millions of dollars worth of artwork. His fascinating story is coming up. Hashtag Me Too in reference to sexual harassment, has become the movement bringing attention to a decades-long problem facing many women and men, especially in the workplace. Given this newfound awareness, 1036 takes a closer look at the faces of sexual harassment here in the Milwaukee area. All of my clients were males, and it was a sort of a boys club. And so I had a lot of experiences that were not always pleasant. Sometimes you just learn to try to find humor in some of the things you experienced and other times you couldn't get out of the room fast enough. In my case, both um, bosses, mm -hmm. male bosses, that um, one of them just said very inappropriate and then another one was um, actually exposed himself. Mm -hmm. So um, in our office, closed the door and that was completely inappropriate. Yeah. Today, Jean Gro teaches advertising at Marquette University. Years ago, she was in the ad business in Wisconsin, Chicago, and New York. Jennifer Dirks used to work for a small business and is now CEO of Tempo Milwaukee, an organization of women in management and executive positions. They are not the only Milwaukee businesswomen who have stories to tell about their Me Too moments at work. Tempo Milwaukee wanted to find out what is happening here. We wanted to really look at putting a local face and a local voice to it. So Tempo Milwaukee developed its own anonymous survey based on federal government definitions. It asked questions about sexual harassment in their workplaces and sent it to all 350 members. Two-thirds of those members that took the survey reported that they had been sexually harassed, personally sexually harassed in the workplace. And what we found for those that had been personally sexually harassed, it happened at all levels, from entry to mid-level to upper management. Women were um, accounting, uh, recounting, you know, kind of their stories of sexual harassment. Jean Gro remembers more experiences back in the 80s and 90s when she could not report the harassment to her boss because she was the boss. Well, I had one client who was quite a famous designer, um, and he was probably one of my best clients. He gave me a lot of work. And every single time that I went to his office to talk about a job, I would find myself having to sort of uh, dodge him and kind of move around the room so that he wouldn't grab me. Um, and that got a little old. And I think sort of the final straw with him was one afternoon we met for lunch to talk about a job and he put the hotel room key on the table, at which point I declined his proposition and all of the work that I had coming from him from all of the previous years dried up and I never had another job with him again. Here's what the anonymous Tempo survey found. Of the 97 members who responded, 68% said they had experienced sexual harassment. 50% experienced it at the entry level, 36% as middle managers, and 35% when they reached upper management. A statistic from um, nearly 50% of those that took the survey also reported that they had personally witnessed sexual harassment. So it's interesting, you know, many of them uh, did not report it, many of them did report it, and then nothing was done. What we found was through the survey results that 40 women um, came forward and really shared their story. Here are two of them, read by women from the Milwaukee PBS staff. Many incidents of comments on my body, my sexual habits, my menstrual cycle, my body changes during pregnancy. I remember one boss in particular who used to regularly refer to me as a real screamer in the bedroom. I'm in a revenue generating position where there are equal pay and equal commission structures between women and men. But when I've won accounts, I've been told constant sexually charged commentary on how I look, such as, it's because you wore a skirt. Lucky you, that guy must want to buy from women. Good that you showed some leg. I'm a horny guy, what can I say? Sorry for that comment. 
your outfit is a great distraction today. One of the, uh, the interesting finds of the study was, you know, we had asked about, does your company have a sexual harassment policy? And if so, would you feel comfortable if you were sexually harassed to report it tomorrow? And a majority said yes, but then there was the majority, there was a min minority that said no, they did not feel comfortable reporting that. And so that was um, surprising and somewhat shocking. No one named names. So we did not have from all of the 40 stories that were told, no one named names. Did anything surprise you in these results? I would say that a majority of those that took said this has positive um, implications, but then there is that uh, minority that said, you know, this might have even um, adverse effects. And is it that men are still kind of exclusive and maybe not inclusive? Are we going back to a little bit of a more of a good old boys network? Um, are we setting the women's movement back a bit by coming out and sharing these stories? And will the relationship between a male and female in the workforce be um, impacted? Whew. Um, I'm willing to talk about it because it needs to stop. And I'm a person of privilege. I'm a white, well-educated, um, upper middle class, urban woman. And I have a lot more agency than a lot of other people. So if I'm not willing to stand up and speak, who is going to be? So I feel like it's in some ways it's my responsibility to stand up and speak. And I can't lose my job. I'm not going to get fired because I'm talking about this. My university would likely encourage me to talk about this. But there are a lot of other people that risk a lot by speaking. So to me, it's important for people like me who have the ability to speak, to speak up. Read all the Tempo survey results on our website, milwaukeepbs.org. 1036 will continue to bring you the faces of sexual harassment in the coming months. And our partners at Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service have profiled other faces of sexual harassment. Read more on their website at milwaukeenns.org. Immigrants, known as dreamers, continue to face an uncertain future. President Trump initially set a March 5th deadline to end former President Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. There continues to be a lot of back and forth discussion in Congress and rulings in the courts. 1036 spoke with two young Milwaukee Dreamers who hope the final decision is when they and their families can celebrate. It is scary um, because if my DACA were to expire and there is no sort of nothing of relief yet implemented, um, you know, there's, a, there's always that possibility that I can be detained and uh, uh, put in deportation proceedings. My DACA expires in 2019. February 2019. Um, I think at this point, I'm you know I'm worried that what could happen because I know that at any moment that can be taken away, and it's not just like until my expiration day comes. It's any day. Cynthia Teus is a 25-year-old graduate of UWM who is a DACA registrant and works with teenagers at the Latino Women's Resource Center of UMOS, a social service agency on the South Side. I came to the United States when I was um, 11. I was going to turn 12 that year. We actually came on St. Patrick's Day. At the age of two, I was able to immigrate. Ever since then, I've been here in Milwaukee. Um, haven't moved, um, and I'm not sure if I want to move. I love the city. Daniel Gutierrez is also a DACA registrant, an 18-year-old who was a freshman at Cardinal Stritch University and attended Pius XI Catholic High School in Milwaukee hopefully going into law school in the next, uh, in four years from now. So uh, it's, been, it's been difficult. There's been def uh, obstacles. Both Cynthia and Daniel have lived in the United States most of their young lives and have been able to work, drive legally, and attend college with the protection of DACA. I applied to my community college in Janesville, uh, UW Rock County. And at the time, um, I was being scouted by, uh, by a soccer coach at UW Rock County. Cynthia's mother chose to overstay her visa, like many migrants, <laughs> and after a brief stay in L.A., moved to Wisconsin, where she worked several jobs to support the young family. 
initially it was because we wanted to come here for vacation, right? And then I think a month went by and I'm like, I think I have to go back to class. You know, I love this. But very clearly my mom said, you know, I think, you know, I think we're gonna remain here for the next year or so. When we came to, um, from California, we, um, we established it in Beloit. Um, I went to middle school there and, you know, and, and eventually after that I went to high school, but only for like the first half, like the first semester of freshman year, uh, because we ended up moving to Janesville. On September 5th last year, President Trump rescinded the DACA program. My DACA uh, deferred action expires in November of 2018. And uh, I, I, I try not to think of it much, but I definitely do, um, you know, keep that in mind that there is a deadline. I don't let that, you know, in, um, take away from, from my everyday life. And something that I learned is that when you're in a movement that needs a lot of energy and you need to take care of yourself. DACA's will be expiring and it's scary for, uh, you know, we're in a state of limbo. Jason Gonzalez is the director of Christian Formation at Pius XI Catholic High School. He mentored a young Daniel and watched him grow into a well-informed and active proponent of dreamers' rights. These are kids who were brought here without choosing to be here, and, um, and they were brought here for, for good reasons. They were brought here to be united with their families again. They were brought here for a better life. Um, and so when I think about, like, why, why is it important for them to to get status here, it's because they, they deserve it, and they're just as American as, as anybody else. Pius held a unity march last fall to bring attention to the school's diverse culture, which included DACA students. No documents are needed to enter your kingdom. Walk with us as you find your way to freedom. Rachel Buff is a professor at UWM and the author of Against the Deportation Terror, a history of immigrant rights organizing in the United States. Anyone who persists and makes it to college, despite the obstacles that confront you as a first generation, you know, foreign born student, it, they tend to be really talented students. There's this sort of um, good immigrant, bad immigrant dichotomy. Like the good kids, they came here, they didn't mean to, their evil parents dragged them across the border, it wasn't their fault, but let's punish the, the supposedly evil parents. My home is here, everything, my whole life is here. I've, I don't know any other country besides the United States of America. And uh, when, you know, the DACA was taken away, it was, it was, it felt like a, a, a betrayal um, from the government because they promised us that if we do comply with everything, we were going to be okay. And um, that was not the case, unfortunately. So you consider yourself American? I don't know, you know. And if you were to ask me, do you feel Mexican? I don't know. You know, because it's, I was when I introduced myself, I introduced myself as a Latina. I wouldn't mind, you know, uh, going back to Mexico and, and, you know, and visiting my family, but I don't think I would stay in Mexico. I come from it more from a, primarily a religious perspective. And uh, being, in, being in a Catholic school, right, what I was taught my life and my whole life and what I teach is that we need to accept the stranger, we need to welcome the stranger, we need to be here for, um, we have to be a voice for the voiceless. Us humans are very resilient and are very, you know, we could be scared at times, especially when we don't know what could happen, but we take a leap of faith, you know, and, and just like my mom took the leap of faith coming here, it would be my turn, you know, to take that leap of faith. This next story is about someone who takes intricate care of million dollar masterpieces from around the world at the Milwaukee Art Museum. While you may never see him, he hangs out a lot in the basement of the museum, you definitely see the impact of his work.
The history of anything is the history of its survival. And the history of art depends a great deal on its ability to survive. And as a museum, we are charged with the preservation of these objects forever and ever. And this is Jim's job. I was hired to, to do the in-house matting and framing. I was not a conservator at that time. It's changed a lot since I started here in 1976. When I first came to the art museum, I thought it was um, a layover on my way to grad school where I was going to be able to study under a famous artist. I still was very focused on becoming an artist. I thought the museum work is interesting and then the conservation work was interesting, but I have to get back to my art. And I would say about 10 years after I started here, so around the mid 80s, I finally realized that, hey, this, I'm on a roll here. This is, this is something that could be a destination. The frame shop that I was put into when I started here, it was actually a holding area for artwork adjacent to the loading dock, adjacent to the garbage room and adjacent to the wood shop. So we were pretty much operating um, from scratch and making things um, just uh, out, of, out of nothing. So this is the uh, mainstream area, but this is my old lab. I had to kind of create a clean space in there every day and keep the door closed and make sure that I was able to um, preserve the art amidst all of the chaos. This whole space has completely transformed with the redesign, but that was a big job for you and your team, wasn't it? Yeah, especially because, you know, the Calatrava was disruptive, but it was outside of the, the galleries and storage areas. I know that Jim started this program and it was just him trying to do everything. And it was really his passion for art conservation and his vision that shaped this program into what it is today. Well, the museum never really thought of having a conservation lab. It was never in the planning stages. There wasn't even a thought of having a frame shop. He understood that if the museum was going to continue to grow at the pace that it had been growing, and once the investment in the Calatrava building was clear that that was going to happen. And I saw, I just stared at that miscellaneous storage space on the blueprint and thought, no, that's the new conservation lab. It wasn't planned for. That was an important moment in this institution's history because we went from kind of the, the a smaller local institution to a more regional and, and national and even international um, museum. We grew like an adolescent where the growth of the collection of the buildings, facilities, of the staff, always um, was uh, outrunning the conservation program's ability to keep up with it. That conservation lab is a, was a way of saying this, you know, if you're going to do that um, from an institutional point of view, you have to make sure you're bringing the rest of the museum with you. It was generally known that we really had outgrown our space. I kind of elbowed my way into it um, proactively as much as I could. He also did, I think, all or most of the fundraising to make this space the way it is and to equip it with the materials and, and equipment that we need. Because the, the project, the Calatrava project, was over budget. And at certain points um, uh, in the growth of the conservation program, these key people stepped forward and really were pivotal uh, just instrumental in making sure that we had a place at the table. I consider my single greatest accomplishment here was to actually get a really professional home for the conservation program. We develop a relationship with the collection. They, they sort of become like old friends. They're the ones who really know the collection in a way that most curators won't ever know because they're the ones who handle the works. We try not to move it as much as possible. It's the Cornelia Parker, once in a lifetime, retrospective. 
Artist intent is very important. It's a, a window into the thinking of any particular period of time. The creativity is certainly involved in, in solving prob unique problems with each individual piece. The rocks are chalk, so they're very lightweight. And so it really requires a very soft wi uh, wire so that it gets the proper amount of drape or hang. But there's a certain point where you have to leave your creativity at the door and really try to get inside the artist's head and determine what exactly they had in mind and serve their purpose. We have three different uh, gauges of wire, which you probably don't notice. The artist is very specific about the distance of the rocks from each other. When you fix a wire, is the piece considered turned off? In other words, is the viewer supposed to kind of say like, look, this is a work in progress and you shouldn't really no. take it in right now? Or is, is it always available for appreciation, interpretation? Um, we take it completely off view. We, hmm. t we take each strand down and uh, bring it down into a large, long table and restring the whole thing and hang it back up. The sculpture is Duane Hansen. The piece is entitled The Janitor. He looks like a real person. He's one of the most popular pieces in the collection. This is why we have white tape around here to keep people from touching and handling it. People really uh, want to steal the pens or add pens. This is a very fat file, <laughs> probably one of the biggest files we have. We have letters from Dwayne Hansen himself. Giving us a very specific um, information on its care. That include clumps of hair and his permission for us to use glue of any kind and replace that hair. You want to make it as convincing as possible. The glasses and the pipe and the case are all definitely from the period that Duane Hansen selected. So he had the fun of going out and sourcing all those materials that I asked for. And so Terry White was able to fashion um, some new leather straps. So we know that it was very important for him to pre preserve that illusion um, of this figure that was sort of fresh and, you know, alive in 1973. There were things that I never dreamed that, that the conservation field would get me to this point. I thought I had to become a famous artist in order to get to the experiences that I um, was ha having. So we have arrived at your much beloved Kandinsky right here. Here it is. One of the artists that was the reason I got into conservation was Vasily Kandinsky. It awakens in me my discovery of art. He would have a paintbrush in each hand. Probably the most profound experience I had was uh, my older sister was so struck with my interest in art and especially that artist that for Christmas that year, I was I think 12 years old, she gave me a coffee table sized book of Kandinsky, which I still have. A few years ago, we did an exhibition on Kandinsky. And I had to do all the very close inspection of these Kandinsky paintings in Paris and then oversee their packing. And I could barely catch my breath because each painting brought out, I had this vision of this 12-year-old turning this page in this coffee table book. And I just wanted to get back to that 12-year-old and say, you're not gonna believe this, but when you're in your late 60s, you're gonna be doing this. To have that kind of access to uh, that painting in the same room and having my magnifying visor on and inspecting them and seeing the brushwork and you almost start communicating with the artist at that point. It really creates um, a, uh, almost a time traveling kind of effect. I appreciate his dedication to the museum. He's someone who I would say unfailingly has the museum's best interest at heart. There are so many works of art that he has saved that might not otherwise be here in the collection if it weren't for him. When you actually have um, institutions, museums committed to preserving art all the way back to the beginning of human history, there's a difference between a fossil and a person who maybe renders a fossil or a cave painting. I think it's uh, really important to be able to um, keep 
it as intact as possible the way the person who made it or the culture who, who viewed it, who, or who treasured it and passed it on to the next generation. Why did they value that? And uh, keeping that value alive is very important. Tell us what you think about the story seen here on 1036. Call us at 414-797-3760 and give us your feedback. And remember, check us out on Facebook and at milwaukeepbs.org. That'll do it for this edition of 1036. We return February 15th right here on Milwaukee PBS. We leave you with some cold January beauty from above Milwaukee's lakefront and river.